Hey all, Professor Tracy back with another Negotiable Instruments lecture and this one regarding warranty liability and conversion. So these are two more theories of liability when we're dealing with negotiable instruments, when we're dealing with notes and drafts. Um, so let's dive right into it. The first thing we're going to look at is the problem and in particular the problem that warranties are trying to address. So if we take somebody here like Bob and Bob has a check and he is issuing that check to Barb or selling that check as is the case here, selling the check to Barb for it's a check for $5,000 and in exchange, she's going to pay less than that, $4,700 for that check. Um, and the thing we need to hypothesize here is this, that the check appears to show the following history, that Bo wrote out a check, right? It says January 1, 2023, pay to the order of shop, $5,000 signed Bo. So from that, we know that Bo is the drawer. We know that the shop is the payee. And wherever Bo has his account, that will be the draw e bank. So Bo then issues that check to the shop. And uh, so remember, the shop's the payee. And so the, the check goes to the shop. And then the shop endorses the back of the check. All right now says pay Bob signed shop. So it is a, uh, a a special endorsement, right? So it's limited in that it, it's not a blank endorsement. So here the check is then negotiated to Bob. And so that means that uh, as we know, it was made payable to him, right? Because of this, the, the endorsement. And then it's given to him. He has possession of it. So he's a holder of that check. And so we can rightly say it was negotiated to Bob. So that's what it appears to show, right? Because Bob has the check. He's now trying to sell that check. He's approached Barb to sell this check, this $5,000 check for $4,700 to her. And so that's what it appears to show. But the question is, when we go back to this check sale, and if that's the his, that's what appears to be the history of this check, and they execute this, right? The check's now in Barb's hand, and uh, the money, the $4,700 has gone to Bob. And obviously, when Barb has this check, her expectation is that Bo's bank, the draw e bank, is going to pay that when that check is presented, right? Because this check originated from Bo, the drawler, writing this check out and ordering his bank, the draw e bank, to pay. And so her expectation, which makes sense, is that that check gets presented, it will be paid out by the bank. But what might go wrong? And this is where warranties are going to enter the picture in just a second because of all the things that could be wrong that Barb doesn't realize might be wrong, which is it could be that what looked like a transfer to Bob, right, an endorsement by the shop and a negotiation to Bob was actually Bob stealing the check and then forging the shop's endorsement on it. So that obviously would be problematic, right? That that would be problematic. And we'll talk about in, in what ways that's problematic. The other possibility is, however unlikely this may be, um, one other possibility is something like the shop stole Bo's checkbook and then forged the signature, wrote a check out to itself and signed out, signed Bo's name, right? So that would be the drawler's signature being forged, the check being stolen, the whole checkbook being stolen. And then it could be uh, that the shop or Bob, when this check passed through their hands, that they altered the amount of the check, that it was actually for $500 and they added on a zero, or it was actually for $50 and they added on two zeros. Um, so it could have been altered along the way. And it could be that the check itself could be fine, but Bo might have some sort of defense to payment. So all of these things could be wrong 
unbeknownst to Barb, right? And Barb is buying this check. And so our, our question is, well, what do we do with that? And the possibility that these, these, uh, th these problems exist. So it, let's play out some of the possibilities uh, of here. If we go with the one that Bob could have stole the check and forged the shop's endorsement, then what does that mean here when Barb has the check and uh, Bob's got the money already, right? They already went through their sale. Well, what does it mean for that? It means that Bob, that Bob wasn't a person entitled to enforce the instrument, right? That if he stole the check and forged the endorsement, then one, we know it wasn't transferred to Bob. He stole it. That's not a transfer. He, so he's not, he is neither then a holder of that check. He would not have been a holder of the check when he entered into this contract with Barb, nor would he have been under uh, the shelter rule. Would he ha have been able to say, well, I took from someone who was a holder because again, it was stolen, right? And we know the other possibility is for someone to be a person entitled to enforce an instrument uh, the check here, they could have been the owner of that instrument and then it was lost, stolen or destroyed. Well, that's not the, if the, if we're hypothesizing that Bob stole it, then he certainly didn't own a check that was then, uh, he lost it or someone stole it from him. He's the one who's doing the stealing here. So he wouldn't qualify as a person entitled to enforce this, uh, this, this check, right? So it, it, that would mean uh, that he's not a Pete, right? So, and if that's the case, then what Barb is getting, Barb can't be getting any right to enforce the check either, right? Because she would not, she's not taking from a holder. She's not taking from someone uh, and getting the rights of a holder. So what she's getting, she's not a person entitled to enforce the instrument either. So that means the check is not properly payable. And indeed, if when that check's presented and Bo's bank pays it out, then remember what that means for their bank is they can't get any reimbursement because the check wasn't properly payable. So there'd be a lot of consequences for that, right? Another possibility, if we look at the number three thing we were talking about, we just look at number one, I know we jumped over to three, but it could be that the, the check was altered, right? And we talked about in the previous lesson that part of what makes something properly payable is that it's not altered. And we said that if it is altered, then it's only payable in its original form and its unaltered form. So that was what you would want to remember here. If everything else was fine and it wasn't stolen by Bob, but yet either he altered it or the shop altered it, then that check would only be worth whatever it, it's only properly payable by Bo's bank in the amount that he authorized when he wrote it out. So she might be way overpaying if it's actually a $50 check, right? Or even a $500 check. So that is, that, that is the consequence there, right? So how do we deal with this? Well, one way we deal with this is to look at warranties, warranties. And there are two that have cropped up. So we have this transfer warranty and what's called a presentment warranty. And so we'll start, let's look at the first one here, the transfer warranty and talk about, well, what do we mean? What is a transfer warranty? Who is it? Is it everybody who transfers a check? And if so, what are they warranting? Uh, and, and what liability it goes with that? So what is warranted? Well, Section 3, 416 tells us the things that are warranted by a transfer warranty. And so it says this, that a transfer or for consideration, right? And that's a really important qualification here, that it's for, in this case, that we're not talking about the word value. We're saying a transfer or for consideration, right? They're transferring it for consideration they warrant a number of things about that instrument that they themselves are a person entitled to enforce the instrument that the instrument is not stolen that there are no forgeries on it so none of the signatures on that instrument are forged 
and that it's not been altered in any way. So the name of the payee hasn't changed or the numbers on it haven't changed. Um, that there's no defenses to payment. They're warranting that, hey, there are no defenses that uh, the draw e bank is going to raise or Bo is going to raise to this, right? So no claims to the instrument. Meaning, remember what we mean by a claim. It's somebody saying, "Oh, that's mine. I'm entitled to that. I, I actually that's have the right to that. It was taken from me. I have ownership rights on it." And they're warranting that the issuer that and and it's even more narrower than than my description means there. It's actually the transfer is warranting only that they have no knowledge or no notice that the issuer is in bankruptcy. So it, it's so it's more limited than saying the issue, they don't have to. Uh, they're not warranting as absolutely the case that the issuer is not in bankruptcy. Instead, they're saying, I have no notice. I am not aware that the issuer is in bankruptcy. So that's those are the things they're warranting. So there are seven of them. I wish there were eight. It would be nice and neat in my little uh, lines there, but there are only seven. So we're going with that. But so then to whom does the warranty run? Whom does it run to? So Here's the way you want to think about it. You have the transferor. They transfer to the transferee. Obviously, it's going to run to the transferee, right? The immediate transferee. That's the obvious one, right? If I'm the transferor and I'm making it's a transfer warranty, then obviously the immediate transferee is someone I'm making that transfer warranty to. But if the transferor endorses the instrument, signs the instrument, endorses it here it, it, with a special endorsement. But um, if they endorse that instrument, then they're liable to all subsequent transferees as well, right? On and on and on. So they're liable to all, so they're liable to not only to the immediate transferee, but to any subsequent transfer, if indeed they endorsed the instrument. So, but this is a key thing, is the warranty applies to the status of the instrument at the time of the transfer, at the time it was transferred. So when Bob has this check and he's selling it to Barb, right? And that they have, it's for consideration. It's a transfer for purposes of consideration that at this point, Bob is warranting only at this point that those things are true, right? That all these things we just looked at, all these things back here, right? That all of those things, the transfer is only warranting that as of the time of their transfer. And they're saying, these things were true at that point in time. If something happens to it later, they haven't warranted that. They've warranted only as of the time of their transfer. And even if the warranty extends forward, it's still, they can only ever be held liable to one of those subsequent transferees for something that they were warranting, right? About the instrument at the time they transfer it, period. That's it. So it runs then potentially on and on and on, but we said it's only at the time of, the, of their transfer that it's true. And so we would say, and if, right, uh, if Bob were to endorse this check, it would run not only to Barb, but it would run to any subsequent transferees from Barb, right? If she's not ready to, to present the check, she's going to sell it to somebody else, transfer it. But even then, it would only be that Bob is warranting it as of right now, this transfer to Barb. So that's the key thing to keep in mind with the transfer warranty. Now, here are a number of things that could breach the transfer warranty. And surprisingly, many of them are the things we said. Here are some things that could go wrong with a transaction like this. Like if Bo's signature is forged, right? His signature is forged. In that case, he's the drawler. If the shop's endorsement is forged, right? So the, a forged endorsement would violate the transfer warranty. Bo has a defense to, 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 to payment. 
Well, one of those would be the, an obvious one would be if he was supposed to get something from the shop and they never delivered that, then that would be a breach and that would be an obvious defense, right? The other party breached the under, in the underlying transaction. Uh, that the amount of the check has been altered, right? That, that, that would be a violation of the transfer warranty. The check was stolen by Bob from the shop. Any of those things would violate the transfer warranty. So we can look at an example here of the transfer warranty and see how this works. Let's assume, so this is a different, we're, we're clearing off the other example we looked at, looking at this one. So Bob issues a check to shop in, uh, here, and then this time, Bo does the stealing, right? So we're back to Bo being our, our, uh, our villain here. So Bo steals this check from the shop, then... Bo forges an endorsement. Notice, pause and look at this, right? Because he's saying he stole the check and then it's making it look like that the shop endorsed the check to him, right? That made it payable to him and signed it. So they're for, he's forging that. And then you're like, well, why is he endorsing again? Because now he's going to sell the, this check to Herman. So he does a proper endorsement, right? He endorses it to Herman and transfers the check him, sells it for consideration to Herman. And then Herman, right? We're just adding on the endorsements to our check here, adds on and says, well, I'm going to endorse it too, and says, pay Barb, Herman. So he sells the check to Barb. And so these were their endorsements, and then possession is transferred. So let's assume that the check gets to Barb and before Barb presents it, right, before she presents that check for payment, Bob issues a stop payment order. And we know if this is a valid stop payment order and it's in effect, then his bank cannot pay that check because the check is not properly payable. If they do pay it, then we know they have no right to reimbursement because the check is not properly payable. So here, well, what is Barb to do, right? She has this check, she paid for this check, she now can't get paid. So the check is dishonored, right? Because there's a stop payment order, she the check gets presented, the check gets dishonored by Bob's bank, then Barb is left having paid for a check, so she's out of pocket, and she has a worthless piece of paper, right? So well, what does that mean? Who is potentially liable to Barb for breach of the transfer warranty? Well, transfers, for we know, first of all, it's the only a transfer or for consideration. We know, one, keep in mind that Bob issuing the check is not a transfer. That's when it's issued, right? So we can say, no, <coughs> there's no transfer warranty coming from the issuer, coming from the drawer of the check. So that is, no, that's not true. Then we can say, well, having a check stolen is also not a transfer. That's not a transfer. That's, that's theft, right? That's somebody uh, taking away the check illegally and not a, a transfer. So we would look at this and go, okay, that doesn't work. So there are only two possible transfers for consideration, right? And here they are. One is Bo, even though you know he's got a, he stole the check and then forged the endorsement to him, he's selling that check for consideration to Herman. So that is he would, and keep in mind, he endorsed it to Herman as well. Because one thing you'd want to think is, well, of course, his warranty runs to Herman, who's the immediate transferee, but it's also going to run to Barb because he endorsed it, right? That's what we said is that the transfer or his transfer warranty will run to the subsequent transferees, subsequent to Herman here would be Barb. And so that's why we can say, yes, he could be on the hook for uh, and liable for violating a transfer warranty. And so we'll keep him highlighted. And then Herman, obviously, is the immediate transferor of that check. So that's pretty straightforward. I mean, and, and in his case, he's the immediate, she's the immediate transferee. He also endorsed it, but it doesn't really matter in this case. But 
Um, needs to say he's on the hook, right? So here are the two people for who could be liable to Barb for breach of a transfer warranty because of the fact, well, why? Let's, let's talk about it. Was the transfer warranty breached? Well, keep in mind, there's a forged, it's stolen, and there's a forged endorsement. There's a forged endorsement. So he is not, he, he stole it, and it, it wasn't transferred, in, it wasn't negotiated to him, it wasn't even transferred to him, right? So he's not a holder, he, he didn't, uh, and it wasn't transferred to him from a holder such that he has the rights of a holder or a holder in due course, and he's not somebody that uh, st- had a check that was lost or stolen or destroyed, right? That's not, he's not a P. And uh, neither, because so we can look at him and go, no, certainly not, right? But what about Herman? Well, Herman is not a holder, right? Because he took from Bo. And Bo was a, just a thief who forged an endorsement, right? So he, he is not, he, he wasn't a Pete. He's not passing on any rights to him to make him a Pete. So this is not going to work, right? Neither of them are persons entitled to enforce the instrument. So in, in this case, um, they are both violating the transfer warranty, right? Because at a simplistic level, it's just one of the things they have to warrant is that they are a person entitled to enforce the instrument. Well, Bo, at the time of his transfer, he wasn't. And at the time of his transfer, he wasn't. So they both breached that warranty, right? Who had a claim to the check? To the check? That's the other thing to keep in mind. If it's stolen, then they have a right to say, well, that's our check. We own it. So it's violated in multiple ways here, right? Because one of the things they're both warranting is that there is no, there, there was no claim on the instrument. Well, there is because it's stolen, right? It's stolen. It's, they have the right to, to, it's theirs. They owned it. They possess it. So who here would be likely to bear the loss if Barb sues Herman, right, for breach, and then um, she can sue her. The most likely thing would be that Barb sues her immediate transferer. She doesn't need to, but that's the, the most likely thing. And in which case then Herman would turn around and sue um, Bo for viol- for the same thing, right? So kind of passing the loss down to Bo. Now, if Bo is judgment proof, which he might be, if he's the kind of guy who steals checks and forges signatures, he might well not have a lot of resources at his disposal. And so he might be basically judgment proof. If that's the case, Herman's just going to be stuck with the loss. And maybe that suggests he should have been more diligent, done more due diligence when he got the check. Uh, So, but what about this example? If we keep going here, um, and look at what's different here is that the shop itself is doing the endorsement to Bo. There's no stealing. They sold the check to Bo here, so no theft occurring. Then Bo does a perfectly, no forgery now from Bo. He's doing a perfectly legitimate endorsement in order to negotiate it to, uh, to Herman. And then Herman does the same for Barb, and then Barb has it. So now there's no theft, there's no forgery, so... The shop no longer has a claim on it that Bo, right? Bo would have been a holder. Herman would have been a holder. They would have been pe- people entitled to enforce the instrument at the time they transferred it. So that if the check, if we say, okay, the check is still dishonored though, this check is still dishonored because, well, Bob doesn't have enough money in his account. Well, but that doesn't affect the transfer warranty. That's not a violation of the transfer warranty, right? Is that a breach? If you look at this and go, well, who, who's potentially on the hook? Well, we know all of them, right? Like, they're, they're all on the hook because why? They, they not only, uh, you know, they, they, they entered into, they transferred it for consideration and they all endorsed it. So they're all liable to bar. Right, because if they because of their endorsements, their warranty is not only running to the immediate transferee, but to subsequent ones for all of them. 
And so you could say, well, aren't they all on the hook? But was the transfer warranty breached? No, it wasn't, right? If they don't pay his the check because of the lack of funds, that is, there's nothing going, if that's the only problem and everything else appears to be in order, there's no longer any forgeries, there's no problem with, with any of the transfers not being persons entitled to enforce the instrument, there's no argument that the check was stolen and therefore the shop had an outstanding claim on it, there's nothing like that, everything's in order, the only problem is that he didn't have sufficient funds in his account. That is not a violation of the transfer warranty, right? Because what it what is it warranting there's no legal reason and we've listed seven legal reasons why the instrument is not enforceable that's a legit thing that's being warranted but signers having sufficient money to pay their obligations nobody's warranting that there's money there to be paid right that there's sufficient money in anybody's account to pay whatever obligation they have on the instrument nobody's warranting that Right, so that's out, and that's all that's going on here in this second example. And so there is there there's no breach of the transfer warranty. So this is not a thing. Barb, that is not the way Barb's going to have to try to get a recovery. Let's look at a presentment warranty. Right, so transfer warranty. We saw it applied every time there was a transfer, um, and then a presentment warranty. Surprise applies when some when the instrument is presented but it works differently than you may think because when you hear the phrase uh presentment warranty it sounds i think more limited than it is quite limited but it sounds even more limited i think based on the name that that it's given so what is warranted this is section 3 4 17 and in particular subsection a which it tells us okay if we have checks for checks the presenter, and then keep this in mind, and all previous transferors. That's the part that is not intuitive, okay? That it's not just the party that's making, that's presenting the check for payment to the draw e bank. It's both, the, it's that, yes, that presenter, but all previous transferors of that check are warranting to the draw e bank. What? Two things, basically that they are a person entitled to enforce the instrument. Part of that being that any endorsements on there are legit, right? They're not forged. That, that if it was transferred to me and there was the need for an endorsement, that endorsement on there was legitimate. So they're warranting that I am a person entitled to enforce the instrument, that that was the case for all of them, that they were warranting that that the check has not been altered. Those are the two things, right? And the most obvious place is the presenter themselves is saying, I'm the person entitled to enforce it. Well, that makes sense that we would want them to be warranting that the person, the party that's presenting that instrument for payment, that they are in fact the ones entitled to enforce it. But the, the unintuitive thing, remember, is that all previous transfers are doing the same thing. So let's, and we'll look at how that pays out. But one thing that is not warranted is the, the um, presentment warranty says nothing about the authenticity of the drawler's signature. Nobody's warranting the authenticity of that. So what about notes? I should say a two, not a one, I apologize. So for notes, it's still running the same that is presenter and previous transfer, but they're warranting obviously to the maker and not to the drawee bank. And it's still this, this that they're the person entitled to enforce it. That's the, that's the thing they are warranting. And you might say, well, what about not being altered? The reason it's not there is there's an assumption that you're presenting it to the dude who made out the note. And if you're presenting it to that person, presumably they would know if it was altered. They would be like, that's not how much that note was for, right? They would know how much they made the note out for. So here, if we do another example that Bob issues a check to the shop, then it's stolen again by Bob. Then we have a transfer slash deposit to a bank. And then it's presented to Bob's bank. This keep in mind, it's a check. So this bank to which it's presented would be Bob's 
bank, right? Because he's the drawer of the check. He's the one who issued that check. So here, we've got to ask, well, can Bob's bank sue Bo's bank for breach of the presentment warranty? So here, keep in mind, Bo steals the check. He then transfers slash deposits it into his bank. And their bank, as banks are wont to do, right? The depository bank here presents it to Bob's bank, the draw e-bank, and they pay it out. And turns out it's stolen, right? It's stolen. They weren't a person entitled to enforce it. So can that bank sue, can Bob's bank, the draw e-bank, sue the depository bank for breach of the presentment warranty? So who is liable to Bob's bank for breach of this presentment warranty? And we'll see that obviously the presenter, right? The presenter and then all previous transferors could be sued for breach of the presentment warranty. So who was a previous transferor? Bo. Guess who was not? The shop was not because it was stolen. And Bob did, was not a transferor, right? He issued the check. So the only other transferor was Bo. So was the presentment warranty breached, right? We said there were two things for a check that the presenter and any previous transferors, they're, they're warranting that they're a person entitled to enforce it. Well, guess what? They're not, right? They're not because Bo was never a person entitled to enforce it, right? And it's true that the check hadn't been altered, right? The, the amount or something like that hadn't been altered, but this is enough, right? So if we go back here and look and say, okay, well, what, are they liable for, for the, and, and they're liable for the value of the instrument, right? So what, what are they liable for? We could say, well, they could be liable, right? Because they, they're warranting that they're Pete's, right? That, and that they are, that their person's entitled to enforce it. Well, Bo certainly was not, right? He stole it. It wasn't, there wasn't a voluntary transfer to him. So he certainly wasn't. And therefore they couldn't have been, right? They couldn't have been. Um, and, you know, the, there are there scenarios where the bank could be, sure, but those don't occur here. I mean, if it was a bearer instrument and it was given to their possession, and they had no knowledge of anything about it, then hypothetically they could be a person entitled to enforce it. But, so yeah, we saw that the first part of that would be violated, not the second. But what about this idea of conversion, right? The front end, we said this is about warranties and about conversion. And so we, we want to think, well, what's the difference between what you cover in torts with the intentional tort of conversion and Article 3 conversion because article three has its own definition of conversion in it, which is in some ways more expansive than the definition under the common law. So under common law, and I, I am just keeping this very simple, right? I'm not going to rehash all of the common law regarding, um, uh, regarding conversion, but conversion is generally thought of as an intentional tort. So typically you would say, the, the person, the defendant is only liable if they knew the property was not theirs to use, right? They have to be at fault. They had knowledge. It was intentional. They knew it was not theirs to use, and yet they did. And, but under Section 3, 420, the rule is different. It's broader. You are liable without fault at all. There's no, you know, uh, mental state on there, right? There's no fault about... Did they know? Should they have known? Were they reckless? Was the you know was it intentional? Was it willful? Uh, was it negligent? You know any of those kinds of things. There's nothing. They are liable without fault at all, right? Strictly liable. If you steal the instrument, so remember we're saying the definition of conversion under Article Three. So this is another basis for holding somebody liable under Article 3, and we're talking about a negotiable instrument. So if they stole the instrument, that would be a conversion. And here's the thing that is less intuitive and much more expansive than how you would think of 
first, removing any kind of fault is obviously more expansive. But the other thing that makes it more expansive is it's not just the guy who's taking the instrument and using it, right? It's instead somebody, if you take the instrument from someone who is not a person entitled to enforce it. So if I just take it from them, right? I could be taking it, not realizing it, but I take it from them and they aren't a person entitled to enforce it, then I am potentially on the hook for conversion under Article 3, even though that is nowhere near what would be thought of as conversion under the common law. Or if the check or the instrument is paid out, right? The check is paid out, it's paid to someone who is, again, not a person entitled to enforce it. So there is so there are broad definitions. So we can have an example. Let's so here we have a workplace that issues a paycheck to Bo. And then Bob is back to his thieving ways and Bob steals Bo's paycheck. And then he deposits that paycheck in his own bank account. He deposits it in his own bank and then it's presented it's presented to to the bank, right? To the bank, which would be whose who's bank? The employer's bank, right? That's Bo's employer. They're the drawer of the paycheck. And it was drawn on their accounts at their bank. They're, this is the drawee bank for this paycheck. And so here's the question, right? They're, they're paying it out, right? It's been presented. They're gonna pay the money out to the depository bank that Bob deposited his bank. They pay it out, okay? Now the question is, can Bo, can Bo recover in, can, who can he sue, can he sue anyone for conversion? If so, who? Who, right? Because realize it's his check. It's his check, right? It's his check and it was stolen. So the obvious person he can hold liable for conversion, we said, well, one, even without any kind of fault, you know, knowledge or otherwise, et cetera, the fact that Bob stole it, he is on the hook under Article 3 for conversion. Then we said, anybody who takes from a non-person in, entitled to enforce that check, that would be the depository bank, right? They take it, he is clearly not a person entitled to enforce the instrument. So that means, contrary to what it may seem, they may seem all innocent because they don't know, but we don't care. Because under Article 3, if they took it from somebody who was not a person entitled to enforce, then they could be on the hook, right? And then who else? Who else? The draw e bank, right? Why? Because they paid out to a non-person entitled to enforce, right? They paid out to Bob's bank. They too were not entitled to enforce that check. Yet they did. So all three of these people could be sued by Bo for conversion under Article 3. For how much? It's limited to the instrument, okay? So if we look and go, Bob got a paycheck from his employer. The only thing he's ever going to recover is the paycheck amount, right? It is not like what we talked about in the last lesson, which was um, wrongful dishonor, where you were, where the bank was on the hook for consequential damages. Here, you're capped at the amount of the instrument itself, so it's likely going to be more limited. So here, we just said, well, there are three possible times that Bo could go conversion, right? Can he recover from all three of these people, right? It's like, well, let's go after Bob for theft and go after uh, Bob's bank for taking from a non-person entitled to enforce. And then we'll go after my employer's bank for paying, for paying out to a non-person entitled to enforce. Can he go to all of them? And the answer is no, he can only ever recover once, right? He recovers the value of the check once, he can go after Bob, or he can go after Bob's bank, or he can go after the employer's bank. He cannot go after all three, he can only ever recover once in conversion. But even so, if you think about this, doesn't it seem like you could potentially have somebody like the employer bank, right, Bo's employer's bank here, liable multiple times over, 
right? Because they already, think about it this way. They are already out the money of the check, right? They're out that amount of money because they paid it out to Bob's bank, to the presenting bank, right? Depository bank. So they already paid it out. So they're out that amount and that check was not properly payable, right? So that means they could not get reimbursed. So they paid out that money. They're not going to get reimbursed for it, right? So that's what the second thing is. It wasn't properly payable. And you know what that means? So you, you, you go. we need to go even further than we did before, which is to say not only can they not get reimbursed to the extent that they already took money out of the employer's account, right? The employer's account, they have to refund that money because it wasn't properly payable. So they're going to be out that, you could say, well, they already paid it out. Now you're saying if they took money out of the, the em employer's account, they've got to put that in. That's right. And then what's the other thing? They could be liable to bow in conversion for the amount of the check again, right? So it's like, well, are they going to be liable multiple times over, be paying out this amount of money on this check over and over again? Well, how do we prevent that? Right. So how does he do, do that? Do they have any way to get their money back so they're not out three times? And the answer is one would be they can sue for a breach of the presentment warranty. Right. They, they could sue from any transferer or the presenter themselves, right? Here, the logical person to go after would be you. Because remember, they're only with a check. They're saying two things. That one, the check is not altered, but the biggie is that they're a person entitled to enforce the instrument, and they weren't. So they breached it, and that would put them on the hook for that amount of that check, right? To say you breached the presentment warranty, you were on the hook. So that is one place they could get money, right? Another thing to understand is because Bo is seeking the amount of the check, and he's suing, if he sues the employer bank, then their payment would be a payment to the only person here who really is entitled to enforce it, right? Because he's the one with a claim to it. He's the one it was issued to, that he's the one who was entitled to enforce it. So if they pay him, then that could be reimbursed from the employer's account because it is a payment to their employee, uh, the person they intended to be the payee of that check. So here's the question we're asking here is what if the employer gets wind of all this and the employer just goes ahead and issues a second paycheck, which, you know, great, that'd be, you know, you have the super nice employer, just goes ahead and issues another check to just to not worry about it. At that point, he has no losses. You cannot sue for any, you have to have actual damages and those actual damages are capped at the amount of, on the instrument. But if he's just given another check for the same amount from the employer, then he can no longer sue, right? He has no damages, he can't sue for conversion. There's some limiting we, that Article 3 does of possible plaintiffs. If you stop and think about these, they make sense, which is the issuer of the instrument cannot sue for conversion. And so if you were to go back and think about this, like they cannot sue, right? It's not stolen from them. Their instrument goes here, right? It, they're issuing it. And typically they're issuing it, they're, they're issuing it to the payee, right? And they have other avenues of getting a recovery, right? Because uh, and, and we'll look at those, but they have other avenues of getting this, this recovery. And the second one is also similar, right? Which is if the check is being issued, for instance, to the payee and they never receive it, then that person cannot sue for conversion either, right? The, the, these parties, we consider them to have more direct rights. With the payee, for instance, well, they would have a right back against the, the, the original party, the issuer, right? Who's issuing the check, presumably because there's some underlying obligation and that the issuer has a relationship with their bank already, right? That they, they can uh, seek redress there. 
but so they, they don't need to go through conversions here. So if you think about it this way, if we change the facts here where the, the, the check is being mailed to Bo and then it's stolen before it ever reaches Bo, right? Stolen by Bob before it ever reaches him, then Bo, even though you could look at this and go, well, the same damn facts are here, like, shouldn't it work? Shouldn't conversion work the same way? Shouldn't Bo be able to sue all these people? Because the same thing happens. And the answer is no, because he never received it, right? It falls under number two. And so we would say he never received it. His redress is to go back to his employer who owes him an obligation, presumably under whatever agreement he has to get paid every two weeks or whatever. So that he doesn't need conversion, right? Even though everything else is the same, we said that the rule is that, that a payee who never received the instrument can't sue for conversion. So if we're looking at this and you're like, wow, here are all these parties are the same. It's just that the dumb check was mailed and Bob stole it before it got to Bo. That's all true, but you can't sue, period. No, right? That's why there's a giant X. He can't sue for conversion. He's out of luck. So there's a safe harbor that exists in um, uh, in the, the conversion. Well, it's in a separate provision. Actually, I think it's not. I think it's actually in for, uh, Section 3420 also, um, the safe harbor, which is that if a bank is acting merely as an intermediary, then it has no liability for conversion, assuming they're acting in, in good faith. So that would look something like this. If we were to insert a bank here, and instead of Bob's bank directly presenting the check to the employer's bank, that there's some sort of third bank that's in between here, an intermediary bank, and they're really just a pass-through in order to have the check presented to that bank. And that happens all the time because checks are shuffled, obviously, Things work slightly differently. The more and more things get computerized and electronic, then you know they, they work differently. But hypothetically, banks are shuffled all over the, or not banks, checks are shuffled all over the place through other banks um, in order to get them to be presented to the proper bank. And what the safe harbor does is say, if you're just acting as an intermediary and passing along the check, then you don't have any liability on that instrument uh, for conversion. So that's it, which is actually quite a bit. I, I hope that's helpful. And uh, if you do find the videos helpful, please do like and subscribe. I appreciate the support. Thank you, and I, I hope that you're doing quite well. Talk to you again soon. Bye.